thank you to Bishop Hanley, who has generously invited me to preach at his last diocesan convention. It's an unusually generous offer, and I want to thank you, Bishop Hanley, for um, inviting me to join you all this morning. So it's happened to most of us at some time or another. You're walking in a public space, maybe it's at the mall or along the side of a road or in a park or on your favorite walking trail. Yeah. And you see someone coming toward you and you smile warmly. Maybe you say hello or maybe you just smile warmly and wave. And they return that with a stern look or a glare or an intentional look like I don't see you. And they keep walking past you. And there it is. You're left with that momentary feeling of hurt, emptiness, and then maybe, typically, anger. I mean, I was being nice. I was being friendly. What is wrong with that person? And so then we decide, you know what? That was stupid of me to smile. I'm never going to smile again to anyone walking toward me because people just are rude and I don't want to feel hurt like that again. Whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. How does unreceived peace return to us? This is an important question because the instruction has an ass assumption embedded into it. There is an assumed wisdom here about how unreceived peace returns to us. And how does unreceived peace return to us in these times that we are in today? The stress seems incredibly high. We have stress on the national level. We have stress at the local level where protests, threats of violence, interesting incursions of people who are at odds with each other seem to threaten our sense of stability and peace. And we have the stress of this pandemic as it weighs on us and wears us down. How does unreturned peace come back to us in these times? And we're only days away today from the national election, which will be historic either way, it turns out. And there are fears of riots and violence and unrest this coming week and maybe longer. So what are we, the church, called to do at this time? What are we called to be in this time? If Jesus' instructions about receiving peace that has been not received by others, if that can speak to us today, what would it look like? And even more, what would it require of us? Offering peace is an offer of openness. When we wish one another peace, our hands are open and they imitate our hearts when we offer peace because we are open. It's the only way we can offer peace is to be open. But it's that smackdown, that refusal, that sneer or worse that Jesus is also instructing us about. And that's why he is making this assurance that your peace, if it's unreceived, will come back to you. But how does that work? It's hard to figure that one out, especially if you have ever been through that kind of experience where your warmth, your openness, your peace was not received, was in fact met with hostility. So if you struggled through that discomfort 
at any time and come through it, perhaps it's because you know a little bit about the work involved in finding that spiritual center so that your peace does return to you. And you know that somehow the spiritual discipline is not allowing rejection or hostility to distort your heart. There is really only one way that peace refuse can come back to us, and that's by embracing vulnerability. It's by moving into that same peace that you just offered. And this is at the heart of nonviolence. It is the core of nonviolence. If someone refuses the peace we offer, it only returns to us because we continue to offer it. We do not withdraw, we do not strike out. We do not try to even some score because we feel hurt or angry. And Jesus knows this. He knows vulnerability is the key, not because he's testing us, but because he knows we do not yet trust the vulnerability that is required to find the spiritual center that is stronger than force and fear. So knowing this, Jesus instructs the 70 to go out to the villages, to the towns, with nothing. He essentially says, go be vulnerable. Be needful of the hospitality and the compassion of strangers. Be needful of the compassion and generosity of the other. And through this vulnerability, he knew that they would come to learn the deeper truths of what it means to follow him. What it looks like to forgive. What it looks like to love. What it looks like to be reconciled what it looks like to offer peace, and if it is not received, to not respond with hostility or retraction. In short, what it means to follow Jesus to be transformed into a servant leader rather than a leader who lords over all. For too long, the church has enjoy, enjoyed a kind of lording over position in the form of, we've got all figured out, y'all come over here. The church has been kind of like the cool kids on the playground. People want to come to us to be with us. We're too cool to go find out what might be going on over there. And I know this narrative because despite my criticism of the church over the years, I've been proud to be an Episcopalian, never wanted to be anything else, and wondered why more people don't come our way. So this passage from Luke's gospel today drew me into a long, protracted reflection on what is required to have our peace return to us if it's refused. What is the church called to do in this instance? How are we called to respond? And how do our fears and our hurts shape us in ways that are not helpful? We know that fear is never the answer. It's never the way to travel if we're seeking reconciliation and healing. But how do we get to this place of having peace returned? If we're in the face of refusal or worse, allowing fear to shape our behavior, being defensive, striking out, that's easier. But the truth is there's no easier comfortable way to follow Jesus, to offer peace. And so we are called to remain open and vulnerable if we are to really, truly, authentically offer peace to others. Now, will we be hurt? Yeah. But avoiding hurt is not our calling. We are not called to be safe. 
we are not called to be secure if it means not extending peace to the other. We are called to be with others, to be vulnerable with them, rather than to have power over them. We are called to be servants who desire healing and who can adapt when hostility confronts us, who can adapt not by being forceful with rejection, but by being open even so and offering ourselves even as it requires us to be vulnerable in the face of hostility. Yes. Not a weapon that we use to subdue an opponent. Peace is a means by which we connect with others in order to put down pretense, in order to put down fear, and to let others into our hearts. Peace is at its core healing and wholeness. It is about the beloved community, alive and vibrant and loving that reflects all that we have learned as we follow Jesus. We need peace now, perhaps more than ever, or perhaps as we always have needed it. Let us be bravely vulnerable as we offer our peace to others and let our peace return to us as a reflection of our spiritual work to continue to lean into that peace, even if it is rejected, even if it is met with hostility. Let us remain steadfast lovers of Jesus, the ultimate peacemaker, who was vulnerable beyond vulnerable on that cross, and who by doing so showed us a new way forward.